from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes, igual. <laughs> I'd like to take a few moments to introduce our next author. She is an accomplished author born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, a magnum cum laude graduate of Harvard University. A true example of the American dream, author of When I Was Puerto Rican, The Turkish Lover, and Almost a Woman, which later adapted into an award-winning film for PBS and a masterpiece for theater. An immigrant to the United States at the age of 13, her curiosity about her heritage turned into a passion to find her roots and know where she came from, resulting in the writing of the masterpiece Conquistadora, a story about a fudging country called Puerto Rico. A Puerto Rican gone with the wind and a storytelling genius. It's my distinct honor and pleasure to stand up here and introduce to you today the brilliant author, Miss Esmeralda Santiago. Wow, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm stunned. <laughs> I'm impressed with myself. <laughs> thank you so much. It's great to see so many people, but I need to know, how many of you are my Facebook friends? Oh, just a few. That's great. Hi there. It's just I love, I love, I love social media. I love the technology. It's always exciting to know. I've been traveling all over the country um, from uh, since the beginning of July. Um, on book tour for um, Conquistadora. And uh, it's just been so exciting to find new readers and my, my uh, loyal readers through the social media, which has been really amazing. I've never been able to experience it quite in that way. So thank you, thank you all for showing up. Uh, and I am so grateful to be here, and here I am in Washington, D.C. at the National Book Festival, and uh, surrounded by the great monuments of our culture, and I feel very, very small <laughs> walking around here, but, um, but it's also, uh, um, there's a great sense of pride uh, of, of being a member of literature today when I know that we're challenged. I know that a lot of people are not reading as many books, although um, I'm reading more books now than I ever did, so I don't know who it is that is not reading. Um, but, uh, but it's just wonderful to be a part of, of, uh, of this, this festival. Um, I want to tell you about my book, and about, about my books. Oh, and I want to tell you, uh, before we go any further, um, that this is your time, really. I'm going to be speaking so long as I can for the, the, the few minutes that I have. But uh, I know you might have questions. And so if I see anyone standing at the microphone at any point, let's just have a dialogue. That's so much more fun for all of us if it's a dialogue than if it is a monologue, even though I do have many jokes. Um, but <laughs> I'd really rather talk to you. And, um, and so at any point, please come to, come to the, the mic and we'll, we'll have a dialogue. Conquistadora is a novel. It's a historical novel, or as my editor says, it's a, a novel with history. <laughs> I don't really see the difference, <laughs> but I call it a historical novel. And um, it comes from my preoccupation with the fact that I had no um, idea who my ancestors were. I would see myself in the mirror every day, and I knew that I'm a mixture of so many different races and ethnicities, and I, and I wasn't quite sure who were these people. And um, I realized that I wasn't going to find these people because they were all poor campesinos, landless campesinos, so there are no records about um, any kind of transactions. Um, my both grandparents were illiterate, so there are no documents. Uh, until the, 20th, the beginning of the 20th century, Puerto Rico was about 80% illiterate, so that was not unusual for them. Poor people couldn't read or write. Um, but here I am, the grandchild of those people 
working every single day with words and with literacy and with trying to tell stories and trying to discover things about, not just about myself, but of course, if you're a parent, when you're finding um, any information about your family, about your history, it's for future generations. It's for your children and their children and um, the ones that come after. I could not find any documents about my family specifically, but I did find many documents about people like them. And um, I just said, okay, well, I am just going to invent my ancestors <laughs> based on this information that I was able to, um, to find. Um, much of it I found in books that I had purchased in Puerto Rico over the years that I would go to the island and they were just in my shelves, some of them unopened. I would just buy them and then, you know, life happens and you just don't get to read them. I begin to read, to, to read them, begin to learn about them and realize, okay, there's much more history in Puerto Rico than I ever expected. And the more I read about the history, the more that these people who are in my DNA begin to emerge as characters in my imagination, in my dreams, in my, if they, they would speak to me, I mean, I literally would hear voices. <laughs> and I don't have a, pr you know, I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really interesting to, to, to know that the history was telling me that I had a novel to write. Um, I did not set out to write a novel. The novel decided I ha that had to be written. And, um, and the more I read, the more that these characters would speak to me, sing to me, um, show me things that I didn't know about. I have been on a horse twice in my life. Yeah. Both times I have been thrown from the animal. Um, and so here I'm writing about people riding across the miles, a horse, you know, <laughs> galloping across. And so I make my main character an Amazona <laughs> because I wanted somebody to believe that I could actually ride a horse, which I don't. Um, but I had to learn about these things. And that that's one of the exciting aspects of writing historical fiction is that you're learning, I was not only learning about myself and about my ancestors and about the history of the place where I was born, but I was learning about things that it had never occurred to me to, to, to want to know about. Um, but I'm a curious person and it was fascinating. How did I ever dare to invent my ancestors. Well, I'm a memoir writer by trade. I'm better known as the author of When I Was Puerto Rican, Almost a Woman and the Turkish Lover, written in the first person, um, written about people, almost all of them still alive, all of them people who read the books, comment, make notes, <laughs> talk to each other <laughs> about what they read. And, um, and I knew that I had a different responsibility in the process of writing a novel because I had, to, I had the responsibility to the history, a history that is virtually unknown in the United States in English and in fact not that well known in Spanish in Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico we have many, many eminent historians writing today, many of them writing about Puerto Rico since um, the invasion by the U.S. Navy in 1898. So our, our modern, our current history is very much a part of, of, um, of our literature, but not many of our authors have gone further than that, have gone back to the time in our history when we were a colony of Spain, when we were not known as Puerto Ricanos, we were known as colonos. We didn't even have, we didn't have a country, we didn't have a name, we didn't have a citizenship. And, um, and so these are the kinds of things that I learned in the process of, of trying to find my ancestors, is that this was our history. Another thing that I discovered and that was both shocking 
embarrassing, shameful, but ultimately, I came away that these people were to be admired because they survived. They survived so that my, my family would be alive. And that is the slaves who were brought to Puerto Rico beginning from the 16th century. Um, we were a sugar cane growing uh, country and, um, and they were the ones who did that work. And I had to create these people because they're not, they're, there's not much written about them in Puerto Rico, in Spanish. I had to find it from many other different places. And also just really literally sometimes sit in front of my desk with my hands on my lap and my eyes closed and say to them, please, please, please speak to me. Speak to me. The people who left documents, I can find all sorts of information about aristocratic Spaniards, about merchants, about lawyers, about the educated um, elite of the island, but I don't have you. I don't have you. Please speak to me. And they did. They spoke to me. Um, I have to say that I'm not a, you know, I'm not a new age <laughs> kind of person. I'm, I'm a very quite a, a pragmatic person and, and very unsentimental. But there was a point in where I realized that they really were, were speaking to me and they, they were telling me this story has to be told. And so I found it, that responsibility, as much a responsibility to them as to the other characters. I did not know, I knew of course that there were Africans in my family because of my, the, the color of my skin my, and my father who is much darker and my mother who is fair. So I knew from my mother probably Europeans from some place, I don't know where, and, on my, and from my father's side obviously Africans at some point. But I had, I had no idea. The book is delivered to the editor, I have done everything that I possibly can to bring life to every single character that I imagined, all my great uncles and aunts in my imagination. One of my Facebook friends <laughs> writes to me and says, I have the same last name and um, I was wondering, maybe your Santiago family and my Santiago family, maybe we're cousins. I'm doing genealogy. I'm retired now, so I have a lot of time. So can you give me some information and I'll find out if we're cousins. And so I gave her the information that I had, my, of course, my father and my mother and their parents. And um, she went off and, and um, did some research and discovered that Conquistadora begins in 1844 when a white Spaniard aristocratic young woman arrives on the island with the idea that she's going to be a latter day conquistadora and faces the reality of slavery, 1844. This lady, my fan from um, Los Angeles I think, says, I have done the research and Esmeralda, the last person that I could find in your line of family is a Juan Santiago who arrives in Puerto Rico in 1844 and is a slave. And I get goosebumps every time I remember that. And I realize you know, it really is, it really was in my DNA somehow. I don't know how it happened. Maybe it's because you believe it that it happens. Uh, so now I'm becoming a little bit more new agey than I was <laughs> before I write this process, this process. But I never expected that I would find my ancestor. And I had to go through this long, long circle in order to discover him. I could have just gone to Ancestry.com, but, but I did it the hard way. <laughs> and we did find one another. I have now, I feel like every single character in Conquistadora is one of my relatives. Uh, when you read the book, some of you might try to guess who these people are. 
um, I myself constantly have to guess which one of them it is, um, but they're all me. I am, I am they, and they are me. And that is something that is very, very, very different, very satisfying, very exciting, and ultimately, as a writer, it's very poignant and very, very moving that I was able to, to connect to something so elemental in my life and to do it through literature. Are there any questions, concerns, comments, complaints? <laughs> Hi. Um, and also, just before I start, I wanted to say that it, I could listen to you say Puerto Rico eight million times. <laughs> um, but my mother is currently writing a book. Um, she is doing genealogy. That was a charge from a religion that was uh, her great-grandmother's. So it's difficult because things cross over and over again. So they're missing dates, they're missing documents. And because of all of those missing pieces, they're essential events in real history that's well known that you can't, you can't really put a character somewhere. Um, it, it may not be feasible. So how, can you tell me a little bit about how you work with the feasibility mm -hmm. of the story and the real events that happen in time that have to happen so that you can enjoy the mm -hmm. history? Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, it's it's a different it's a different situation because she's looking at the gea geneolo genealogy. Um, I was actually I had the freedom to find the history and decide what part of the history was the one that really touched me emotionally. And I remember doing just you know a lot happened in Puerto Rico. <laughs> Puerto Rico has been going on for many many centuries, but I kept finding little phrases here and there, a paragraph or a sentence or an allusion to an epidemic of cholera, 1855 to 1857 in Puerto Rico. But really just little, little pieces, you know? And I'm going like, wait a second, you know, the fact that it's an epidemic <laughs> means a lot of people were affected. It wasn't just an illness. Um, and I was just obsessed with the idea of, 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 of this, cholera epidemic. It has to be in this book somehow, but I couldn't find enough information about it for years. I really, um, I mean, I began to, to, to research this book before Google, so you can imagine. Um, when, when I decided that I had to write about it, even though I didn't have enough information, then I had to give myself permission to use information about cholera from other places because I couldn't find it in Puerto Rico. Cholera is cholera, it doesn't matter where it happens. You know, it's the same disease. Um, and I realized that my character has to have been touched by this because one of the little bits of information that I found was that 75% of the people who died were people of color. So here's a woman who is a slave owner. Obviously, some of her slaves must have been affected by this. And I said, this is, this is her big challenge. This is going to be her big challenge. The minute I made that decision, Google, Google is invented. <laughs> and all of a sudden, information begins to arrive. Uh, and and I'm able, I was able to, to learn a lot about it. But you know, one of the things about researching for history to be a novelist is that most of what you learn you throw away. Because when you're a novelist, you're dealing with the characters. You're not, you know, the history's there, but you're dealing with the characters. What happened to them? Character in action. And so a lot of the things that I had notes for and I had put in my timelines, and believe me, I'm, I'm one of these logical, organized persons. I have charts, Excel charts, and colors, and whatever. When I got to that point, um, it didn't, none of the other research mattered. All that mattered was the one that I, that I had emotionally connected to. Um, and I think, you know, when your mom, she will discover, you know, History doesn't happen. History is created by the people who live in any particular place or time. So history is not separate from us. We, we are the history. And so she will, she will discover which history in her family 
is the part that's important to her family. And some of it, it doesn't matter. You know, some other family will have greater things to say about that. But that surprised me. I spent years, years, years researching. I have, there was one mutiny. There was a, a mutiny in Puerto Rico in 1855 where the soldiers in El Morro, in the, the fort, the fortifications, had not received their salary for two years. And so they were not happy about this. <laughs> and so they mutinied. And so they got into the fort and they turned the guns that were usually turned towards the Atlantic against the enemies of the island. They turned the guns toward the people in San Juan who then of course go into their homes and lock themselves in. And I thought, oh my goodness, that is so dramatic and it's so amazing. I, I can't even tell you how much I learned about guns and cannons and soldiers and their uniforms and all. I spent probably months researching it and ultimately I was not able to include it in the book <laughs> after I went through all that. I mean, I kept trying to put it in there, but I couldn't, it just, it didn't have the same emotional weight as some of the other um, events. And so ultimately I just had to put it and say, now I'm telling you about it. Any of you who are interested in military history, it's a really cool story. <laughs> Not only what happened, but the aftermath was very interesting. And, uh, you know, maybe another book, maybe another time, I don't know. But it was, it was um, it, it's, it's, it's the discoveries and the excitements of working on this kind of a book that is completely new. It's something that you don't expect and, and you can't plan for it. It's the serendipitous moment that will give you something, send you off in a completely different direction and uh, sometimes just for your own pleasure, not necessarily for your reading uh, pleasure. Hello, uh, I read your book and I really enjoyed it, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just interested in, for a lot of you that haven't read it, maybe you don't wanna comment on this a lot, but I was interested in how you as a novelist inserted the twins as characters that really play a big part as the husband and the twins of your uh, main okay. characters. Yes, the two characters, Ramon and Inocente. Yes. Um, well, uh, Anna, the main character is Ana Laragoiti Cubillas, and she, um, she's a young woman who just doesn't want to, to fit herself into 19th century civil, civil society but she wants to go to Puerto Rico to be a conquistadora and she learns that these two young men, these identical twins that she met, uh, had inherited land in Puerto Rico and so she decides to marry the eldest of these twins because then they'll be able to go there. She'll convince them to move to Puerto Rico and she does. How did, he c how did they come to me? Well, not very hard. Um, my husband's an identical twin. So I know about his relationship with his brother. There's, there's two, two ways that people talk about twins. Either the twins who are very, very, very close, and then they're the twins who don't wanna deal with one another. And my husband is somewhere in between both of those extremes in his relationship with his brother. Um, so that's one way, because I'm, I'm thinking about twins. The other way is that my mother, who had 11 children, lost a pair of twins, uh, were born stillborn. And so in our family, they are like the ghosts, you know, in our family. We, we, who could they have been, these two? So in my imagination, they came back as Ramon and Inocente. And also, the third reason is because my books are about identity. And what better study of identity than identical twins? You look at somebody who looks exactly like you. You are in you're looking at a mirror, and how do how do other people relate to you? So, so I you know did a little bit of research um, about twin relationship, but mostly I just tried to imagine what that would be like vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, you know her situation, and um, for those of you who read the book, um, no, uh, my husband and I 
do not do the same thing that Ana, Ramona, and Inocente did. <laughs> we, uh, we didn't. Um, but I did imagine that there was a possibility uh, that there would be identical twins and would play tricks on a young woman who was innocent and protected and, uh, and would share her. And um, so that's the way they came to me. And that's why you read about them. If you stand up, I'll be able to recognize you. Um, yes. Hi, I have a more general question on the writing process. I read your books in Spanish. I'm Puerto Rican. Um, do you translate them in English? Do you prefer to write in Spanish over English? And how is the process? Uh, yeah, yeah, about my, my language. I, um, I, read, I, I read in both languages. I'm completely bilingual. When I write my first drafts, they are in bilingual, whatever that language is. Uh, sometimes bilingual in a sentence, sometimes in a word, um, because I just write in the way it comes. Um, but my literary language is English, um, and I discover it when I try to write in Spanish that I just don't have um, the high level of literary language in Spanish of my favorite authors in Spanish. And so I write in English. Um, the books are translated into Spanish, but the first two books, I did the translation. Um, and I remember when I, uh, this was when, when, when I was Puerto Rican, I never thought that, um, that I would be translating it into, into Spanish. And it was such a poignant time for me. I wrote this book in English because it was, you know, my editor doesn't speak Spanish and I had to write it in English. Um, in the process of, of translating it, I realized that the book probably would have been different had I written it in Spanish. I don't know how, probably a more poetic language perhaps, because that's what our language does. Um, perhaps um, some people have told me who've read both languages, they find that the Spanish uh, is funnier than the English, and so you probably you see the tears in English going through the Spanish. Um, after the second book, I decided I was not going to translate myself because the challenge for me was to translate it and not to rewrite them in a different language. And, um, and I just didn't want to do that. That it wouldn't be fair to writers who, you know, readers who could do both. Um, but, uh, but that's why I write in English and, you know, I wish, I wish I could, I, I wish often I, that I could write, um, a whole book in Spanish with the same comfort with which I write in English. Yes. Hi, thank you for coming out today. Thank you. Um, I was a teacher in Puerto Rico. I taught eighth grade English and was always looking for ways to piqued their interest not only in reading, but in reading in English. And we really found a lot of success with your book, When I Was Puerto Rican, um, because of your images that they were familiar with, with the flamboyant trees and the piraguas and things that they could really relate to. And I was wondering if you ever went back to Puerto Rico, if you had workshops or spoke in schools, because I think you're a really positive role model. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for using my books. <laughs> Um, I, yes, I, I do actually, it's not possible for me to go to all the schools that I get asked to go. I do video conferences with, with um, high schools and colleges and universities, and you can find me on esmeraldasantiago.com, and you'll find out how to do that. Um, I, you know, when I, when I wrote when I was Puerto Rican, it was written for the girl that used to go to the library every single day looking for information um, because what the kinds of, I was a very ambitious, curious, some would say competitive <laughs> little girl. And, um, and because I was ambitious, there was much that I wanted to know and that I wanted to do. But in the books that I found, there was no one like me doing any of the things that I wanted to do. Not one, not one Puerto Rican girl eldest of seven, then 11 children, single mother, living in Brooklyn tenements, poor people, grand grandmother who drinks a little bit too much, 
um, neighborhoods where you just have to lock yourself inside your apartment because the streets are so dangerous. I didn't find people like that in, in those books, and I wanted to find people like that because I wanted to know how do I live in this place? How do I live in this age? How do I become the person that I want to become without any information about how to do that? Um, and so I had to pretty much invent my own life because my mom couldn't help me. You know, she did, she tried, but she couldn't help me. She didn't have the same ambitions that I had. In fact, she challenged a lot of my ambitions because it was terrifying to her that my ambitions meant that, I would, that they would take me away from her and from our family and from our community. But at a certain point in my life, I realized what I want does not exist here. It does not exist in these tenements. They, it does not exist in these streets. It does not exist in this place. I have to go elsewhere. And so I began to invent this person. And I really, literally, just like I hear voices <laughs> of my characters, I would go to bed every night. I shared a bed with my sister, Delsa, and I would close my eyes and I would try to imagine that I was in a big, big bed by myself <laughs> and that when I woke up the next day, I would be in my own room. I wouldn't be sharing my clothes with my sisters <laughs> and try to imagine a different person because the person that I was is not the person I wanted to become. And that's why I wrote, that's why I wrote this book, is because I wanted other kids to realize that you can have ambition, you can have visions of yourself different from the visions around you, you can have an idea of yourself that challenges even your parents' idea of you and achieve them. And, um, and so I wrote the book for me and my children and I'm, I'm thrilled <laughs> that more people than that have had an opportunity to read about it and hopefully learn from this example so that other girls especially, but also boys who go to the library now can pick up a book and say, oh, oh, this happened, this happened, this happened just like me, but you can do this. That for me is wonderful. She's the oldest of eight. She's the, I'm the youngest of eight. And so we needed that. My question to you is, since you gave me and my sisters, all th six of us, um, a voice and somewhere to find, and now I'm a mother of a 13-year-old, have you ever considered doing fiction for teenagers or younger so that I can find something that will look like her and that so she can grab onto like we did? Thank you. I, it, it's been asked of me, um, but uh, I now have this, my, the next 10 years, if I live long enough, <laughs> is pretty much structured with, um, with this series of books that I want to write. Um, and, uh, you know, writing memoir was very interesting because I didn't have a chance to write about sex. <laughs> <laughs> so, and now that I can write fiction, I can write about it. It's now that I'm an adult. And so, um, so no, I haven't, I have, I have not done that. Um, and, I, and I don't know that I will. I do hope that other writers will be inspired by the idea of the many Latino writers who are now writing. And some of them will focus on that age group. But um, I just, uh, I really want to write about it for adults right now. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Thank you for coming. I also really enjoyed your book. Thank you. I wonder if you're planning to write a sequel mm. to it. I would very much like to write another book w in which the characters in Conquistadora appear, not all of them, but most of them, 
and it's right now up to um, the publisher, Knopf. <laughs> they have to, um, to agree, but my Spanish publisher, Santillana, has already agreed that I should write a sequel. It's not a sequel, it's really more a continuation. I have always envisioned Conquistadora is the first of three or four books. And that's the way I have structured it for myself. I have them all outlined. I know what happens well, over the years and so on. And, uh, and so I have been working very hard at trying to um, put together enough information and write enough pages for the, uh, the editor to say, yes, go for it, so that I don't have to get another job and not time to, <laughs> I need the time to write. Uh, and so that's what I'm doing, but thank you. Yes, I hope to do that. Follow-up question. I'm really sorry. That's um, okay. So it seems as if um, the cholera epidemic was a solution to your um, feasibility issue that I asked about earlier. Um, can you tell us another, or your, the f most um, interesting solution to your um, to your historical nuggets that kind of come in and become kind of an anchor for your story? Well, I, you know, there was so. Th th then when I became when I became enamored of these characters, then I wanted every single character to have a moment. I wanted all the ones that I fell in love with, these are my aunts and uncles, remember, and my grand, you know, grandparents. Um, I wanted all, all of them to have a moment. And there's one character named Sinha Damita, who is the, the midwife, you know, and I wanted, I wanted a moment for her. And I wasn't sure, you know, it wasn't enough that she delivered the children or that she, you see her going back and forth around the hacienda. I wanted her to have a moment. In 1848, when um, there are uh, insurrections in Martinique, Guadeloupe, St. Croix, um, the governor of Puerto Rico is in a panic because the slaves there are, you know, they're in revolution. And so he wanted to keep them in control. And so they developed something called Bando contra la raza africana. It was, a, it was laws that were established against African, the African race. This was against people who were of color. It didn't matter if you were slave or free. It did not matter. And so I said, well, which one of these characters that I love so much would be most affected by something like this? Obviously, the slaves, that was obvious. But I wanted it also to be affected by a free person. And so, so I gave Sinha Damita her one you know, moment, not a happy moment, it was a sad moment, but it was really important for me, for the readers, to know that this happened. This has been forgotten in our history. This is a footnote in our history, and I refuse refused to forget that, that that happened there. And, um, and so, I, so I made, I, I created that moment for her, brought the history that took place. The history in Conquistadora, every historical event in that book happened in Puerto Rico, including the hurricanes. <laughs> um, and what happens to the characters is what I invented, but using their history, I, I made, uh, made sure that the, um, that the history was accurate. And in fact, my publishers had like three different historians looking at it to make sure that I wasn't making it up. I was not making it up. But now this person now becomes real. This happened to this woman because of that law that was placed by scared white people in San Juan. And, um, and so that's how, you know, as a writer, you find those kinds of things. You make your characters, you find them, you love them. Even the ones that you don't like, you have to love. I love Don Luis, even though I don't like him. You know, but you have to love them. And each one has to have a moment in your book, I think. Uh, as a reader, I look for that in your writing, those of you who are writers. And if you don't do that, I'm disappointed. And as a reader, I, as a writer, I want to do that. I want to give you the satisfaction that those, those people that I love, each one gets just one little moment that make them real and make them human to you because they're not real to, to you in the same way that they're real to me. These are my relatives. To you, they're your friends, <laughs> I hope. So, so I think we have time for one more question and then we're all going off 
to different places. I think somebody's walking to the... When you write about your family or characters that may remind you of your family, how do you keep your family from getting angry at you? Or how do you warn them that this may not paint a pretty picture <laughs> of you? I don't, my, my fiction, in my fiction, my family's not in my fiction. In my fiction, it's my friends, actually. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, it's really, it's just a c combination of everything that I've ever learned uh, in my fiction. In, in my nonfiction, in my memoirs, all the characters, um, the, the, the protagonistas, characters is not the right word, but the protagonists um, are my real family and they have their real names and their own foibles and flaws. And um, I have to admit that when I first wrote when I was Puerto Rican, I thought my family would stop inviting me to Christmas parties and and the bautismos and all that stuff because they would not like what I wrote. But in fact, has been the opposite experience. Uh, my mother, my mother's reaction to when I was Puerto Rican, almost a woman and the Turkish lover is, I don't know, people keep talking, you know, keep telling me that this book is about you. This book is not about you, it's about me. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she likes that. And my dad says, I am proud that I am the villain in these books. <laughs> so they have, they have um, been very generous and very welcoming. And I think the reason is that I didn't lie who, about who they are. My mother did have five husbands, one after the other. Yes, she was a single mother. She had 11 children, didn't marry any of the husbands. This is the reality. My grandmother was an alcoholic. Yes, she was, you know. And so I gave them their reality, and it's not necessarily the most proud moment when you read about that, but you also read about the love, about the generosity, the warmth, the fact that we would rather spend time with one another than with anybody else. And that's, that's the part that they love about these books is that they are real. And um, so those of you who are going to write memoir, don't worry about that if you are presenting real people, you will have a problem if you lie about them, if you whitewash them, if you pretend they are other than who they are. Because people know, they know, they know who they are. So just be, let them be real. Well, thank you all so very much. I hope to see you at the signing booth. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.